Yeah, so I was asked to talk about um, a few fun cases I've seen during the period. Um, and these are definitely some fun ones. Uh, probably not very fun for the referring veterinary who came to me, but for me, they were fun to deal with. Um, I am interested in gastrointestinal disease from a research standpoint, but um, Braxfire and Braxfire Heights interior are definitely on my top five list. Um, this is probably, as we would say in Brazil, raining on the wet, something everybody already knows, but we'll just quickly go through this slide to remind everyone what is swine century. So swine century, first clinical description in 1921, simultaneously Indiana and the UK. Uh, we did not know what caused this until 1971, and then that's when something called uh, Serpolina hyacinteria, now known as Brachyspire hyacinteria, was associated with this disease. Swine century classically described as mucohemorrhagic diarrhea and colitis, tiflitis is in there as well. What that means is that the colon gets very angry. Um, we may see some inflammation and um, necrosis in the, in the cecum as well. And essentially, when we walk into a barn, if there are affected animals, that's the picture you see. Um, feces, it's a funny thing, right? You walk into, uh, you're walking through pens, you don't always see bloody feces, mostly because if it's water floor, which most of the barns in the U.S. will be, and other countries, um, they will disappear. So you really sometimes may have to jump into the pen and actually look for them to make sure what you're seeing is really blood. But this is the clinical picture. Uh, Post-mortem, that's essentially what we see. We send that in for a diagnosis. We'll, we'll actually talk about it in a second here. Interestingly, is the fact that this guy up here, Braxpire has interior, is classically what we associate with swine century. This was up to the early 2000s or so. Uh, more recently, Braxpire hampsoniae, which was just recently described less than 10 years ago, has been associated with the exact same clinical syndrome. You cannot distinguish whatever disease Braxpire has interior cause from what Braxpire hampsoniae causes, but a different bug. Um, this two here in light, it's supposed to be orange, but whatever color is this, Braxfire spinatine and Braxfire murdochii, it's hard to understand if they really could cause or not swine sintry. Do they really cause mucohemorrhagic diarrhea and colitis or not? There's some evidence, or let's put it this way, some case reports saying that they do. Most of the times we assume they don't, but don't kid yourself. Braxfire are very tricky. Uh, the one in blue here, Braxfire plus coli, no worries, uh, won't lead to bloody diarrhea at least, but there will be some degree of diarrhea. We classically call it uh, spirochetal colitis, so it's a bit um, different from what happens with Braxfire and Hampsonia and The main thing here, though, is probably associated with pathogenesis. These two Braxfire here in red do not ever attach the mucosa. As far as we know, there is no specific toxin that will lead to the to the disease, to the clinical signs. Differently from Brax Pyroplos coli, it will attach the mucosa, and that's how pathogenesis begins. So, huge difference, and surprisingly, this is a much more mild disease from the clinical standpoint than the other two can cause. Classically, this is what we do. If you may have or suspect you have swine century in your barn, um, diagnostic workup will go like this. Clinical signs will be observed. Interestingly, for swine century up to the 90s or early 2000s, it was strict bloody diarrhea. It was known as bloody scours, and that was it. Nowadays, it's, it's not so bloody, as in you kind of see what we like to call a poop gradient. Things go from watery and green to mucoid and red. You do see the mucoid and red as eventually. It doesn't mean you always see that. There's, there's this shady area. Uh, gross lesions, again, they are restricted to the colon. If you find anything else anywhere else, unlikely that it's brachyspira. Um, it, again, it ranges from mild mucosa hyperemia to the full-blown necrotizing colitis. Um, the samples are collected then formally and just standard, sent into the diagnostic lab. Pathologists will send back a description of the colon sections. Crypt elongation is there. Usually we believe that cryptan elongation is because of the accumulation of mucus, but there is something to do with the way cells start sloughing off and the fact that there is epithelial loss. So probably the crypts are also trying to replenish those cells a bit faster, and they end up not really finishing their cell cycle. 
so the crypts look a bit more, a bit stretched, they're essentially bigger. Um, there is obviously epithelial erosion and tons of, of lymphoid tissue, lymphoid cells are associated with those lesions. Nothing abnormal, nothing out of the ordinary, given the clinical signs. Um, culture, and that's where it gets fun. <laughs> We do do culture for Brachiosphyra. Uh, it takes a long time. If you are expecting an overnight culture, something to grow and that's it, it's not gonna happen. It takes anything between two to 10 days before we can call a sample negative. Essentially, what we see there, if you have one of the bad Brachiosphyra, as in Hyacinteria or Hampsonia, it's a strongly hemolytic spirochete. That's all we get and that's all you can learn from culture. You don't know which one it is. All you know, it's strongly hemolytic and that's suggestive of Regispire, Hyatt's interior, or Hampsonia. Uh, the last 10 to 15 years, we're luckily that we have, we live in the molecular biology era, era, so we have PCR available as well, and that helps us speciate and tell you who's doing this. But it gets a little trickier, and we'll talk about it in a second here. This is the first case. Um, it came to be kind of um, <laughs> in a desperate measure. Um, multiplier farm, high health, absolutely nothing uh, out of the, of the expected. No PERS, no mycoplasma uh, pneumonia, no APP. They just had to treat for ileitis for a given reason, uh, but it went away. And recent here, I'm talking about a few months. Um, in this specific batch, we knew that these guilds were gonna feral in, a, in less than a week. Uh, and there were no clinical signs whatsoever of swine sintry. But this here was a huge problem. They had nowhere else to put that batch. They had to ship that batch somewhere. The barn was essentially full, so they had to make a decision. And that was critical for this veterinarian. Um, this is what I was given to work with. Uh, they routinely would pull fecal samples, around 40, submit that for PCR. And these guys were, in their vision, unfortunate, and my vision, fortunate. They got some PCR positives in the, what they call high CTs. So I'm gonna take a technical break here, and this is not the veterinarian me talking. So I'm taking off my veterinary head. I did a PhD in my, veterinary microbiology, and I spent a lot of time playing with real-time PCR. And we tend to talk all the time about CTs and how we say, this is a CT of 35 or a CT of blah, blah, blah. What does that really mean? So the way real-time PCR works is this. You have primers that will amplify whatever sequence you're looking for, and that's very specific, meaning you're only finding really what you should be finding. Um, over time, as those, 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 tar, those primers produce more DNA, it starts literally accumulating and piling up to the point that there is a signal coming out of, for the machine to detect, and that's when we start seeing these curves. It basically means we have enough DNA being amplified to be detected by the machine. That's great. The lower the CT, the more initial DNA you had, right? So it's counterintuitive. Low CTs means a lot, high CTs mean not so much. First things first, things first anytime I've ever seen anything above 30 CTs, very suspicious. A lot happens after 30 cycles in a PCR machine. Primers start attaching to primers, polymerase start polymerizing things that it should not be polymerizing, it's, it gets confusing. It really gets confusing. So anything about 30 CTs, really, there's a high risk of false positive. We're not quite sure it really is what it should be. There's ways we can verify that. So if the diagnostic lab's not reporting that, you can possibly ask them, can we verify uh, if the amplicon, as in if the result of this PCR amplification, it, it really is what it is, but it's hard to quantify anything that's in here, and it should really be interpreted with caution. And the other thing, super important, don't forget, if you ever get CTs again from your diagnostic lab, real-time PCR is different from qPCR. Real-time PCR does not quantify anything unless you have a standard curve associated with your run. Anytime you report a CT, that's relative expression. You're not quantifying anything, it's something in relation to something. So unless there was a standard curve and there are genome copies or DNA copies or anything associated with your results, you're not quantifying. It's not a mistake, but it's very misleading to say that a high CT or a low CT means this much or that much. 
Anyway, I just want to take the time to talk about that because it was critical on this one because they had a positive response from the diagnostic lab, but on the high CT, so what does that mean, right? Clinically, there's nothing. We walk around the barn, everyone's happy and happy. There's no, no uh, indications whatsoever of swine sintry. Um, we necropsied a few pigs. Obviously, these pigs were healthy, so we necropsied healthy pigs. Uh, no GI gross lesions whatsoever. Uh, submitted it for the regular uh, diagnostic workup, so histopath all around the GI. No microscopic lesions, but we could visually see spirochetes up on Varthing Faulkner. So silver staining will stain for bacteria, and we could see the S-shaped bacteria hanging around the colon. And colon culture, culture came back as weak hemolytic. So I've told you five minutes ago, only the strong hemolytic one matters, so who cares, move on with your life. Not quite. We'll talk about weakly hemolytic and strongly hemolytic brexpire in a bit, but before that, this is a fun part of it. We did see brachys we did see spirochetes, which is different from seeing brachyspira. Spirochetes is a whole phylum within the whole bacteria domain. And we know that spirochetes are part of the normal microbiome of pigs. It obviously varies between pigs and between farms and between whatever else. Feeds, there's lots of factors that will tell you how much spirochete you may have on your microbiome. But it is there and it's normal. There's absolutely nothing pathogenic about every single spirochete ever. We know that brachyspire is pathogenic, some of them, not all of them, and they could be a very small portion of that microbiome. But again, even if we look at this very small portion, so this is in healthy pigs, what we did is we look at a bunch of unhealthy pigs, what the brachyspire population looked like. And lo and behold, there is a whole population of brachyspirus. Even though you culture a given brachyspirin and identify that by PCR, we know that there is lots of other brachyspirus surviving in an animal. So having a high CT for a brachyspira is an indicator of a presence of a DNA, correct? Is that an indicator of disease? Highly questionable. So moving forward is, uh, with this case, and because we had um, this colo culture here of weak hemolytic brachyspira, we obviously ran into this, right? We're not the first ones. This was back in 2016, so everything was just coming out. Um, how brachyspira hides interior, classically described as strongly hemolytic, was actually showing up everywhere in the world as weakly hemolytic. What does it mean? We're not quite sure. But it's not just us, it's North America, South America, Europe, and Australia. So this thing has been around, and we don't really understand the significance, but we can find it. So in this case, it was very challenging. Um, because this was a multiplier herd, and we had to make a decision within a week or so, uh, we were unfortunate enough to start asking questions. And if you ask those questions, be prepared to deal with the answer. If you don't want to know the answer, you may not want to ask the question. Uh, in this case, it could really affect animal trade and transportation. But because there was no clinical evidence whatsoever, and it were, were high CTs, essentially what we did was repeat those PCRs, make sure, again, that they were either negative or on the high CTs. And in this case, we did not see any problems downstream. Things just moved on. Uh, no problem whatsoever. I just wanted to bring up these two points, right? PCR positive only means DNA. There's no association with viability. Could be that something went through the gut and died, and that's it. Could be. Um, and seeing spirochetes in the colon on histopath. Again, spirochetes are not just brachyspire. There's a whole phyla there. There's a lot of things that could be there. It's hard to interpret. But because there was no disease and the way we're progressing with brachyspire ecology, and the more we understand about it, it's very, it needs to interpret that data very cautiously. It doesn't mean anymore that if you have a strongly or weakly hemolytic brachyspire that you do or do not have disease. You need to see the whole picture. This is another fun case, slightly different though. Um, Fair to finish, uh, they, they were somehow somewhat high health, but um, they had a history of recurrent diarrhea in the GDU, um, and they had a history of brachyspira. We did look for the usual suspects, anyone else, Lawsonia, Salmonella, uh, nothing else present there. 
So this is this was our initial approach. Um, obviously, we started seeing bloody diarrhea. Um, went on culture strong hemolytic, completely expected, just like textbook. Um, antibiotics went in. We did start a very stringent cleaning protocol to make sure that we're cleaning uh, between batches and things were actually getting properly disinfected. Um, Pest control, we knew there were rodents around, and actually there were cats around as well, so we had to get rid, rid of all of that. Very challenging. Um, the staff had to work overtime, not super happy about doing that all the time. Uh, again, it's one of the problems of this. And the other part was monitoring introductions. We did not want to bring anything else after we started antibiotic therapy, so any introductions had to be um, investigated. Um, it didn't work. Um, we did not see bloody diarrhea anymore, which was great. Uh, we did use sentinel gilts coming in as in to check if they would develop diarrhea or not, just to make sure things were not there anymore. Uh, downstream, we may have seen some loose stools, nothing bloody. So again, hard to interpret exactly what it was, but definitely not associated with brachyspira. But we could not completely get rid of it. And after some time, we start seeing the PCR positives high CTs, weekly hemolytic brachyspira. No gross lesions, no colonic microscop microscopic changes whatsoever. So again, we didn't have disease, but we're starting to see this bug. In this case, it's uh, a bit different, right? It's literally putting evolutionary pressure in the population, and that's how we interpret this. We did all this, we did a great job, we, it actually worked, we stopped clinical disease. But unfortunately, what we were looking for was strongly hemolytic brachyspira. And we did a good job. We got rid of it to the point that the weekly hemolytic strains start emerging, right? We literally selected for the weekly hemolytic strains, and that's what we end up seeing after a given period of time. And this is likely what's happening all around the globe, right? We do a good job actually finding this bug, and then something else pops up that is similar, but it's not the same and it doesn't seem to be associated with disease. But really, at the end of the day, the question is, can I just get rid of swine century and not have to deal with it at all? It would be a great thing to do um, and a great thing to achieve. Um, most of the times, uh, very specific, obviously we can try antibiotic therapy. Uh, it will go into this side here. DPOP or partial DPOP worked well as well. Uh, recent review actually coming back from, coming out of uh, uh, Swiss group did reveal that costs were a big, uh, that they were very important and very relevant to the farm manager in the decision making process. But workload was definitely a huge impairment. Like staff together with veterinarian did not like to do all of it. Um, they did say that they would not do it again if they had to in this specific publication here. Um, so again, it's a it's, it's a balance, right? And it, each case is a case. You want to make sure you consult with your bar manager. You want to make sure you consult with the staff, at least to make sure that you can follow up. Once you start the procedure, if you stop in the middle, it's going to be a waste of everybody time, everybody's time and money. Uh, finding a good source of pigs, clean pigs, is another challenge. And then finally, keeping some, your eyes open to make sure it's not coming in. And how do we do that? is this little cycle of getting rid of SD, right? Um, we know there are carrier pigs. Not every pig with Brachyspira, Hyacinthia, or Hampsonia will show clinical signs. This could be pre or post uh, clinical signs. So there is a window of four to 14 days, sometimes even more, between exposure to the pathogen and presentation of clinical signs. Those pigs are a great source of pathogen. Um, the environment, we know it survives very well in organic matter. We know it survives essentially everywhere. Hard to get rid of it. Uh, rodents and birds really like shedding it. Brachyspira hampsonii has been isolated from geese, from any different, uh, many different um, bird species. So, and we know that mice can not just harbor it, they shed it and they keep it around for a long period. So it's another huge problem. Uh, feed, it could potentially be transmitted by feed as well. We know that some, there are sporadic cases associated with contamination, but it's hard to really track where it's coming from. But at the end of the day, getting rid of science entry is a long-term commitment. 
And what you want to make sure is that you have this commitment because we know it has an impact on staff. What's the problem with brachyspira and diagnostics? This is the challenge we're facing right now. It's almost like we got too good at it that now <laughs> it became a problem. Classically, this is what we see. Here's your strong virulent brachyspira. This is a strong hemolysis, so you can see a white blur over here. This is what we would call a weak avirulent brachyspira. You barely see anything. This is what we're starting to see right now. We don't fully understand. We're calling it moderately hemolytic brachyspira. We're not quite sure what it means, but we do know that they cause subclinical colitis. We don't see disease. There's no bloody diarrhea, but functionally, we have shown that those colons are not the same as a normal pig. Those colons are unable to control ion movement. Essentially, they secrete too much chloride, which can drive performance loss. So we're still trying to understand what's going on with this, but this poses another diagnostic challenge. Uh, if you're looking for brachyspire and using PCR, this is what they would use. 99.9% .9 of the diagnostic labs probably use this 23S RNA species-specific PCR for BHIO and uh, BHAMSONIA if they have it as well. PCR is known to be less sensitive than culture, so PCR will make you miss a few samples. Um, a few labs will use this genus-specific PCR, so basically what it means is it detects any brachyspire. The problem with that is that you need to have a follow-up test to know which one of the brachyspire that is. Ideally, and this is the answer I gave um, to the first case from the multiplier. They wanted to know, do we care about this brachyspire or not? And I said, the only way we can do this is if we get this train we isolated from your pigs and use the, uh, the best uh, diagnostic tool we have, which are the pigs. So what we did, uh, cultured it, did, it, did our genus-specific PCR to make sure that it was brachyspire, it was, took the sequence data, identified what it was, took the culture, pure cultures, put it through pigs, and waited to see what happened. That's the only way you can answer the question, this is or this is not a pathogenic brachyspire. Any other way, it's unlikely. It's probably just statistics or, you know, you're playing with a crystal ball. So in summary, spirochetes are everywhere. Brachyspire is likely to be everywhere as well. It's hard to know when they're pathogenic or not. We probably, and actually we don't understand enough about the pathogenesis of this bug to be able to tell when they become pathogenesis or not. Um, diagnostic technique really matters. PCR versus culture, sensitivity versus talking about weakly and strongly hemolytic. It really matters. Um, hemolysis is definitely not an indicator of disease anymore. You cannot just associate a weakly or strongly hemolytic brachyspire and say this is, uh, this is an important one or this is not an important one. Um, again, we need to go back to individual herds and evaluate what's applicable to each one of those. Some, some herds are better and you know they're going to follow up with your recommendations for a cleanup and disinfection, so you might consider doing that. Some herds you might, you're better off just doing partial depop and following up from there. Some herds are better off with doing complete depopulation. Um, and really, the main challenge there is follow-up. After you've done all that work, can you keep it out of your barn? Can you really ensure that biosecurity will not allow brachyspire back in? That's probably the biggest challenge nowadays, and that's where we need to focus to get better at this. It's that and understanding how disease works so that we can hopefully develop a better way to, to stop it and control it. Um, with that, I'll thank you, barn staff and managers who let me in their barns and come in with crazy ideas, referring veterinarians who came to me and said, I have a problem. I really appreciate you bringing those problems to me and uh, allowing me to move forward with my residency program. And um, yeah, and everyone else have. Thank you.